Tell me if there's anyone here who maybe you forgot about that surprised you that they fell into the category of RB1. But what we're going to do is list off 12 guys who finished 1 through 12 last year in points per game scoring for running backs. Now, in the quarterback episode, we look specifically at total points for the season. Tyler, why is it that we've decided to make the shift to look at half PPR points per game this time around? And there's a couple reasons that I can think of out of the gate. I mean, the, the reasons go on and on, but the real reason I think about it is just it gives you a much cleaner idea of what a player did in the year. Um, and I know that, you know, when what they finish is like, oh, they stayed healthy. But, like, I really operate from a lens or a, an area, I guess you could say, where I just assume if they're a healthy guy going into the season that I have to assume that they're going to be healthy. I'm not going to – I know that players are going to get hurt. Football is a violent sport. But at the same time – it's that I don't know who that's going to happen to. And, and there's a lot of research and studies have done that you can't really predict injuries anyways. So it's like in, in an effort to be like more even going into it, it's just like how do they perform in games that they are healthy, which essentially gets you to points per game. All right, Jake. So it is the summer of 2021. Trevor Lawrence is the hottest commodity in the world. Urban Meyer is ready to light the NFL scene on fire. And we are discussing running backs. And future you comes and says like, hey, Top four running backs next year, points per game, are Derrick Henry, Jonathan Taylor, Austin Eckler, and Joe Mixon. Would you have believed that or had any strong feelings about any of those guys? I, prob I probably would have fought Mixon if somebody told me that last year, but bes but I wouldn't have fought it that hard. Realistically, like you can see all of those guys, especially in their offenses, You know, th there was no reason that any of those guys couldn't have been in the top four there. Yeah, I found that interesting in particular just because Mixon and Taylor are two guys who were definitely not going in the first round, and to see them up that high is a little bit surprising. Tyler, five through eight, Alvin Kamara, James Conner, Leonard Fournette, Christian McCaffrey. Yeah, I mean, I think I would have been most surprised that McCaffrey was all the way down there, but we all know why <laughs> it was the injuries. But that's kind of surprising. I mean, Kamara, not surprising whatsoever. But Conner and Fournette, uh, you know, two players that I, I don't know if – I wouldn't say I left them for dust, but like I pretty much had given up on these guys. Connor had burned me a couple times. Fournette, I thought it was just it was over for him. Like Lenny wasn't looking good. Um, so for you to tell me that Connor and Fournette finished in the top eight at the beginning of last year, I would have absolutely called you insane. Yeah, we'll discuss that a little bit more when we talk about the running back dead zone. But Connor and Fournette, there, two guys going second in their backfields respectively, with Chase Edmonds going ahead of James Connor in consensus ADP last year and Ronald Jones going ahead of Leonard Fournette. Jake, back to you. 9, 10, 11, 12. Najee Harris, Nick Chubb, Dalvin Cook, DeAndre Swift. This one struck me as the most like, yeah, that checks out yeah, of all I, of the group. I think you could make a really good argument that a lot of people would have expected Dalvin Cook to be much higher. So that like could come across as surprising, but nobody else on this list shocks me whatsoever. This is basically like probably if I went back and looked at what I had my rankings, like – this probably wouldn't be too far off of what I had. Yeah, very interesting phenomenon for me here in particular as I put this together. I'm curious if you happen to have any feelings on this, but Derrick Henry at 23 points per game, and then right after him at number two, Jonathan Taylor, 20.8 points per game, which are real solid numbers. DeAndre Swift at 13.7 came in as an RB1 back there at 12. That 10-point gap from the top to the bottom seems like a really large spread in points per game. I think it says a lot in particular about the people you're targeting at, at the top. Um, I don't know if that is, is generally normal or not. I guess you two would know better than me. So I'll kick it your way, Tyler. But is that, is that something that we should anticipate every year that your low end RB ones are still going to have that wide of a gap from the top to the bottom of that one tier? Um, You know, when I think about it, I don't think I'm, I'm trying to like, one thing that sticks out to me that I have to address first is like the amount of like that 23 is pretty good from Henry like Jonathan Taylor finished like what is that 20 what do you say 20 point I should have it up a 20.8 like that's pretty low for the RB1 to average that many points per game um, I mean that's one of the lowest I think we've seen in the last like seven or eight years off the top of my head I mean we see that number being wow. usually much higher um, I'm just let's see where I pull up 2020 here but like um, we like we saw like 27 for McCaffrey 
Uh, Delvin finished RB2 in 2020 at 22.6. Evan Kamara finished RB3 at 22.4. So he'd have been tied for RB4 last year with that points per game. So I think the ceiling there is much lower than I would have been expecting it. But, um, you know, so I think that that that's actually might be a little little bit tight without me like going back and really looking at the data. Um, I would say that that that's actually a little bit tighter than I expected. I expect that gap to be a bit wider, but more so not from the 13 from the Swift side, more so from that RB1 needing to be a couple notches higher. That that RB 13 ish, I'm um, sorry, that or 13 points per game or whatever Swift has there. To me, that's like probably not too far off. I would expect around the 13s to 14. So. Yeah, I'm, I'm looking, I went back to 2019 data as well, and that had CMC at about 26, and then the drop-off from him was like a six-point drop-off, and then a bunch of guys within like two or three points of each other, but it was about a 12, like a 10 to 12-point spread from RB1 to RB12 seems to be pretty common, so yeah. just about that range, at least in half PPR. All the more reason to take your guys at the top, which I think we'll talk about here in a moment. But just curious, Jake, do you think that that could be a product of how NFL teams are now using running backs? Like, I get there's some outliers here, like Christian McCaffrey, who really doesn't have a ton of competition. But, like, Nick Chubb is there with Kareem Hunt. DeAndre Swift always has random other pass catchers there. Jamal Williams took some of his work. Like, James Conner split some time with Chase Edmonds before he really burst onto the scene. It looks like a lot of these guys are now sharing more work than maybe we would have seen them share in years past. Is that fair? Oh, a hundred percent. I mean, if you go and you look at like the snap shares of running backs, there's basically five running backs that are pulling a 70% share of the snaps when healthy. And, and those names are Najee, Alvin Kamara, David Montgomery, Derek Henry, Dalvin Cook, every single other running back in football played less than 70% of the snaps. Whereas if you go back in time, let's even just jump back to 2018, you know, uh, you know, it's a little, you know, it's pretty close. You know, they don't have complete data for all of the years, but like, I think we're seeing a lot more guys who are playing less snaps. Like, especially like you're saying, like there's so many more split backfields, you know, we've already talked about a few split back backfields here, but you know, the running back is one of the more important positions in the minds of NFL front offices. And, and but they don't like to draft the players like that anymore. At least they're starting to get smart there. Uh, but it also they want to protect their investments. They want to keep them as healthy as long as they can if they don't need them to be like a Christian McCaffrey and be the focal point of the offense. That is interesting. Well, let's look at the way that these running backs were being drafted last season. And I guess this is a good place to point out again that the reason we're looking at this from the perspective of points per game is because a lot of you who are listening to us may be thinking about the running back that you took in the first round last year, like Christian McCaffrey or Dalvin Cook, with a somewhat sour taste in your mouth. Maybe you took Derrick Henry and you got torpedoed at the end of the season. Uh, listen, our advice is to kind of sit back and push your feelings aside on how you might feel from their overall point production and just look at points per game. Last year, ADP, the top five picks were all running backs. Christian McCaffrey coming off the board first, finished eighth. Dalvin Cook coming off the board second, finished 11th. Alvin Kamara finished fifth. Derrick Henry finished first. And Ezekiel Elliott, who was the consensus fifth pick overall, still managed to finish 14, which is a very respectable finish. And I know a lot of people have a sour taste in their mouth from taking Zeke. If you look at the end of the first round, you're going to find guys like Aaron Jones, Austin Eckler, and Nick Chubb, who finished 13th, 3rd, and 10th, respectively. The only running back going in the first round last year, gentlemen, who finished outside of a running back two would be Saquon Barkley, getting taken about 9th to 10th at the end of the first round and finishing 36 overall. And like we previously mentioned, you have guys like Jonathan Taylor and Joe Mixon who are not in that first round ADP that end, that end up finishing at the top of the board in terms of points per game. This year, if you compare it, you will see almost identical numbers and identical names for average draft position and people who are being selected. Most notably, Javante Williams and DeAndre Swift are the two guys who have kind of worked their way into this category of folks that we're talking about. So it seems to me like we're comparing apples to apples here where we're talking about taking the same set of guys in the first and second round this year that we would have taken last year. You got a lot of people at home who were burned by a good number of these players through injuries and other circumstances. What say you to those people? Jake. 
Uh, you draft a guy who's going to win you games. The reason we're drafting these guys so early is because in any format where a pass catcher is getting extra points, these guys are going to be the most valuable assets. And Christian McCaffrey, we saw it the year, you know, the year before this where he, yes, he only played three games. He had nearly 30 points a game. You, you're looking at, you know, a, a Dalvin Cook. He's going to catch, catch some passes in that offense. Alvin Kamara, going to catch passes. Zeke, going to catch passes. Aaron Jones, going to catch passes. Austin Eckler, going to catch passes. These are the guys that are going to win you those matchups and win you the league. And, and we see the guys who are, you know, typically, you know, some of those fringe guys, your Antonio Gibsons, your David Montgomerys, those guys are going to be more in that, like, mid to low RB2 range. They just don't catch the passes at the same volume that these top guys do. These top guys are going to be the ones that are going to win your, your league. If you want to play it safe, go for it. But that's not going to be – you're making an upside play in the early rounds of the draft. I'm not going to take a guy who is safe in round one. I'm just not going to do it. I'll, I'll take the risk of an injury. If I'm drafting a running back, the chances of them getting injured are already super high. Might as well take the running back that can score me 25 plus, 25 plus points in a week. Tyler, before we start talking about the dead zone, any thoughts you want to contribute to this last bit here? I agree. Jake had a lot of great points there. Um, you're, you're, you're playing fantasy football to win. You're, I mean, if, you're, if your goal is to make the playoffs, which it is in some regard, it always should be, but like you, you always should be aiming to you know win your league. you got to be number one out of 12 or 14 or 10, however many you're playing with. And that's not really going to happen if you're not playing to win and grabbing guys that can score you the most points. So sometimes you just got to take a little bit of a risk, risk it, get the biscuit, and that's what we do with these running backs. Final thought for y'all before we start talking about the dead zone. It, very few guys, I think, feel maybe more sour than Antonio Gibson, who we were hoping to get a huge breakout season out of last year, and it just didn't quite happen. He was drafted as the 12th running back off the board at the end of the second round. All said and done, he finished 18th, which is a very solid running back, too, in points per game. His 13 points per game for someone who I think admittedly we were disappointed by 0.7 away from being an RB1. So remember that when you're doing your drafts at home and you're maybe worried about taking guys in the second or third round, that these are folks who, according to the data, they hit they hit hard and they win you weeks when they do. So 